Greensboro Church of God yes, with amen. us. Amen. Amen. And uh, on this keyboard over here, I'm going to let him introduce himself. My name is Austin Taylor. I've been with North Greensboro off and on since 2010, I'm thinking. Yep. I've been playing piano, keyboard, and anything I can get my hands on, basically, since I could barely stand up. So, And I play all by ear, never read a lick of music, nothing at all. So I'm glad to be back. I've, it's been a couple years since I've been here, and I'm glad to be back with y'all. We're, we're glad to have you back. <laughs> okay, you want to introduce your family? Yeah, I'll introduce our folks. It's a blessing to see everyone with us today, and it's been a long time, and we're glad to be back. Amen. And I, will, I can't think of a better way to carry on Brother Dwayne's legacy than to come back and minister to you fine folks again. Amen. We miss Brother Palmer, but we know where he's at. And he's walking and talking on streets of gold. Yes, yes. Amen. But my family here, they've grown a little bit. The kids have. Noah is 15 now. He's in the wheelchair still, but he's 15 now. Jenna's 17, getting ready to be 18 in next July. And uh, then in the back, we have Brother Danny and Brother Josh from our church. And... Uh, then we've got, of course, my lovely bride, Jamie. And I'm glad that she's here today. And so we are just delighted to be here. We're here to worship with you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's ask God to touch us. Father, we love you today. God, we praise you and give you glory. We ask God that you would anoint our time together today. We pray that every need would be met, God. That, Lord, you would receive the glory for everything that's said or done in this service this afternoon. We praise you, God, and thank you in Jesus' name, Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's worship the Lord. Sister Janie comes to lead us in a few songs, and then she's going to do a special for us. Now, I probably won't use this mic too much because I got a loud voice. My voice carries. So, um, anyway, we are going to sing a couple of songs out of your songbook. If you'll take. seems like anymore with this song because one day if we're a child of God we're going to fly out of here amen and we're going to that better land praise God so help me
voice sounded good. Praise the Lord. That's awesome. Thank you so much for helping me. And uh, we will sing. I'm going to be singing an old song that I sung this morning at church. And you guys will probably know it. So definitely feel free to sing along with me. It is entitled, Thank You, Lord, for Your Blessings on Me. And, uh, you know, if we have a roof over our head, and you, you guys live here in these apartments, so you definitely have a roof over your head, and you've got shoes on your feet, food on your table, and most of you probably got a good family, and that's things to be thankful for, amen? Uh, so help me sing this old song. Anyway, <clears throat> I lost it. Give me another one. Again, we're from the North Greensboro Church of God, and we're just glad to be here today. To man, it's good to be here. We announced this this morning in our church that this was going to be our evening service, and uh, we are honored to have it here with you. So, if you have your Bibles today, let's go to Psalm 127. Psalm 127, we're going to look at verses 1 through 2. Psalm 127, verses 1 through 2. And the word of the Lord says the following. Accept the Lord. Build the house. They labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city. The watchman wake it but in vain. Verse 2 says, It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he give his beloved sleep. The title of my message this evening is Let the Lord Build It. Amen. Let the Lord Build It. We'd like to welcome those watching my Facebook as well. Father, I love you. God, I praise you. 
I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity we have to be here this afternoon with the residents of the Carolina. I thank you, Lord, for those from our church that are here, God, both family and friends. And I'm asking, God, that you would just anoint our time together, Lord. I pray, God, you would touch us in a mighty way. And I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to carry on the ministry that Brother Palmer started, God. And Lord, I just pray that you would be with each and every one. Give us the touch we need today in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the biggest struggles that we have today in today's time is the constant struggle between the flesh and the spirit. Paul knew the early church struggled with this. In fact, he wrote in several passages, such as in Romans 8, verse 1, where he says, There is now therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. In Romans 8, 5, he says, For they, they, they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the the Spirit. He writes to the church at Galatia, Galatians 5, 16 and 17, and says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to another, so that you cannot do the things you would. And then in Philippians chapter 3, verse 3, it says, For we are His circumcision, which worship God in the Spirit, and rejoice in Christ Jesus, who have no confidence in the flesh. Peter also noted this struggle. In 1 Peter 4, verse 6, where he says, For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. The struggle is real, folks. I don't care how old or how young you are. From the teenager to the young and middle-aged adult to the senior adult. The struggle is still real between the flesh and the Spirit. It's something that we're going to battle every day of our life. I was speaking to a man recently who was in his late 80s and he talked about that he still struggled with it. And here he was, 80, in his late 80s, pushing 90. So people struggle with, with this flesh versus spirit. And our main text this evening provides that God needs to be the one to build us. That we need to indeed let the Spirit of God have complete control of our life. The house can only be built if He builds it. The city can only be guarded if He guards it. It is vain for us to labor for the bread of sorrows of our own when God grows the food and gives rest to His beloved. I want you to understand that in the New Testament, the house of God is mentioned as an assembly of believers. We understand that when the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 12, 23, to the general assembly in the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men perfect. And then we see in Hebrews chapter 10, 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but so, so much the more exhorting one another, so much the more as you see the day approaching. We as individuals are also mentioned as a spiritual house of God. First Peter 2 5 says, You also are lively stones are built up as a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, But know ye not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. So we have a twofold view of the house of God. But the psalmist makes it clear here that whether we are a house of God as a church of believers 
or a house of God as individual believers, unless the Lord builds the house, it's thing. Amen. Notice in these two verses that three times the word vain is used. Anything a man does without the Lord's help is vain. Solomon points this out in Ecclesiastes. And when he talks about that, the word vain is mentioned so much in Ecclesiastes. And then James also brings this out in James 1, 26 and 27. If a man among you seem to be religious and rather not his tongue, but the seed of his own heart, this means religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. So let us look at this in more detail this evening. First of all, we must understand that the Lord must build the house. And we understand this because we see throughout the Old and the New Testament, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit build. In fact, we understand in Genesis 1, 1 it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. We understand Jesus was a builder, both physically and spiritually. We see this in Mark chapter 6, verse 3. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph, and of Judah and Simon? Are they are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. Matthew 16, 18. And I say also unto thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The Holy Ghost is also a builder because in Acts 1 8, Jesus said we would receive the power of the Holy Ghost and become witnesses. So we need to understand that we've got to let the Lord build us. And we've got to let Him build the house. And this means build the church. Acts 2 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added unto the church daily as such to be saved. We need to let the Lord build us as believers. Colossians 2, 6 and 7 says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him, rooted and built up in Him, establishing the faith that ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. But if we try to build the church ourselves, if we try to build the church as in the flesh, it's going to fail. But if we build it and as a spiritual house and let the Lord build it, hallelujah, I've come to tell you, friend, no matter what comes, what may, Matthew 7 says that he that heareth these things of mine and doeth them will build like a house built on a rock and the flames flooded, the winds came and blew upon that house but did not fall because it was founded on a rock. Hallelujah. But if we try to build it in the flesh, we read on down in 26 and 27 of Matthew 7. It says, And everyone that heareth these things of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon a house and great was the fall of it. We must let the Lord build the church and build us up as His people. Yes. Now does that mean we sit around and not do anything? And just say, Lord, build it? No. No. Nope. It means that we've got to collaborate with Him though. Let Him build it, but we've got to go out and do our part in the Great Commission because Matthew 28, 18 and 19 says, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Mark 16, 15, He said, I am going to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It is our duty. We have been empowered and built by the Spirit of God according to Acts 1 8 to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. But we get to another part of this verse. And it says, except the Lord keep the city. And it says, the watchman waketh but in vain. 
In the Old Testament, we understand that building and battling go together. We can think of that in the story of Nehemiah, where he, in verses 17 through 18, had them building the wall. And it says this, And they which building on the wall, and they that bear burdens, those who have laid it, every one with his hands wrought in the work, and the other hand held the weapon. For the builders, every one had a sword girded by his side, and so built it. And they, he that sounded the trumpet was by me. Why was this with Nehemiah? Why would they sit there and have tools and rebuild in the city with a sword on their side? It was because the enemy was lurking. Because you see, in the story of Nehemiah, there was two people, Sanballat and Tobiah. And they were determined to stop Nehemiah every which way they could. Everywhere he turned, he would receive a letter, he would receive threats, he would hear the rumors, he would hear the gossip, he would hear so much stuff about what they were going to do to try to stop him, but he kept building anyway. And the enemy of our soul, the devil, is lurking. And they won't, and, and you see what we've got to understand is that this enemy is going to try to stop us. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be sober, be diligent, for your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. We must be on guard. God has called us as a church in this hour to be a watchman on the wall for the city. But I'm here to tell you, but the watchmen in this story, some of them fell asleep. Isaiah asked the question, Isaiah 21, 11, and 12, the burden of Duma, he called out on me saying, Sir, watchman, what of the night? Watchman, what of the night? The watchman said, the morning cometh, and also the night. If he inquire, a turn, come. Watch chapter 25, verse 5. Those that were watching, those that were waiting for the bridegroom, they all slumbered and slept. No matter if they were wise or foolish. To the point Paul gets to the church at Rome and he tells them in Romans 13, 11 to wake up out of their sleep. Their salvation is nearer than what we believe. I've come to tell you something this evening, no matter how young or how old you are in this place. We need to wake up out of our spiritual sleep. The Lord is near. Yes, yes, yes. Even this morning I was in my devotion time. And I was praying and talking to God. And God just spoke in my heart and said, Warn the people. And that's what I'm going to be doing. Warning the people. Not just my congregation. Not just those here. But those that I see. Jesus is coming back again. And I see the, our message as the body of Christ shifting from one of just grace and mercy to one of warning and judgment. You don't think it can happen? Do you remember two and a half, almost three years ago? One day we're, we're doing our thing, we're going around, we're having... We're having uh, our, our stuff. We, In fact, my wife and I and family just got back from prison. The church, the week after 9-11, was the most filled it had been filled in decades. Right. Right. In two weeks, though, their attendances went back down to the way they were before 9-11. Right. You would have thought that what we went through with the last two and a half years would be a wake-up call to the church. I want the church again. But instead, it's been the other way around. Mm -hmm. There's been a time of, of falling away in every church. In fact, as I shared with my people this morning, there's people who don't even care about coming to church. And this is supposed to be our nourishment. How are you living off of eating once a month? But I want you to understand, we need to let the Lord do it. Isaiah 40, 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Psalm 46, verse 10. 
Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I'll be exalted in the earth. But then finally we see in our text this season, it is vain not to have rest. Not to have rest. Verse 2 says, It is vain for you to rise up early, sit up late to eat the bread of sorrows, and so you give because you love sleep. This is talking about tolling in the flesh. Eating the bread of sorrows. This means tells us, Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Galatians 6, 9 says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Yes, thank you, Lord. But the second part of this deals with worrying. And Matthew 6, 30-33 says, Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass in the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much shall, shall not more clothe ye, O ye of little faith? I have therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or where we shall be clothed? For all these things doth the Gentiles say, For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first, the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Mm -hmm. Philippians 4, 6-8 says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So what we need to understand is we've got to let Him Build the church. We gotta let him build the city, and we gotta let him build us as individuals. We need to quit carrying the weight of the world on our shoulder and give our burdens to the Lord and leave it there. Yes, I like what the big Bible commentary says, and I'm closing with this thought. Totally in vain. Are all efforts towards security outside the will and working of God, whether it be a house or a city, the laborer, the builder, it's the diligence of the watchman or worthless about the overriding providence of the Lord. Early or late hours, long days of toil and anxious care, or without value apart from the divine provision. Eating the bread of sorrows is, means getting gaining your bread with anxious toil. Most commentators understood. That he giveth his beloved sleep to mean that God gives his beloved the necessities of life and sleep, or while they sleep. That means while you're sleeping, he's working. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord. While it don't look like nothing's going to ever happen in your situation, he's working behind the scenes if you keep trusting him. Yes. Thank Hallelujah. You. Thank, you, Thank you, Jesus. It is possible that this psalmist you sleep as evidence of the trustful attitude that banishes anxiety. The servant of the Lord is still required to labor at the task of his or hers, but his or her labor is not fretful or anxious. He or she can lie down in restful sleep at night in the confident faith that God will take care of her, take will take the best that that he has been a, he or she has been able to do and make it sufficient for the need. God, touch each and every one here today in the name of Jesus. I pray that you be with those, Lord, that are here, Lord, that are suffering today, God, that have needs in their lives. I pray that you would meet every one of them in Jesus' name. I pray today you would touch each and every one that has come to this service and with you say, Pastor Bill, I do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior, and I'd like to be saved today. If that be you, would you just slip up your hand? Father, I pray right now for these precious residents, God.